Okay, we're going to look at um, Roland Barthes' Death and Return of the Author today. Um, follows on quite naturally from where we left off last time, which was in post-structuralism, because post-structuralism, to reiterate what we um, said last time, uh, is always pointing out to the fact that there are signifieds, transcendental signifieds, concepts necessary to the whole debate or discussion in almost any literary field or actually pretty much any intellectual discussion that are necessary to appeal to in order for the conversation to make any sense. So we need to have a concept of being, of personhood, of beauty, truth, and goodness, of justice, uh, and even and this is uh, Bart's point, the idea of the author himself. We have to believe that there is such a thing as an author and we can appeal to the author. And really he's, he's riffing on what I think almost always is the case in the modern academy, which is a debate that arises in the 18th century but gets expressed in the Romantic period uh, about the contours of the Western intellect. And, and uh, we'll, we'll see when we come to Foucault in a couple of weeks, he is going to even argue that the concept of man comes into being in the 19th century. And it's a sexualized form and a heterosexualized form of man. But the, 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 the whole notion of what, a, what man is in a generic term, he says is a late development, a 19th century development. And what is assumed in all of the thinkers and writers I'm going to talk about, and literary theorists in general, they, they, the debate and the discussion of topics always begins in the Romantic period. Always. And they almost, with, almost without exception, ignore everything that comes before it. And so they are assuming the legitimacy of the Romantic terms of engagement with literary theory. And, um, and that assumption seems to me to be totally unscholarly. And it begs many questions, and it, but it certainly uh, will not allow you to correct any errors that might arise from the Romantic projects. And if you find difficulties within literary theory, and these literary theorists are always arguing against other literary theorists because of the problems they have, and they are often, in their view, fundamental problems that they need to address and so forth, one would have thought that they may say, well, maybe the problem lies m less in the critic and it, there might be a deeper problem than that. And that's my contention. The, the uh, theories that arise uh, are the products of the human sciences and the human scientific project itself. And that begins in the anthropological pro approach of uh, Rousseau and um, the French encyclopedists of the 18th century and then it gets expressed popularly in the Romantic period by the, by the French Romantics, yes, and uh, Rousseau I'll count as one of them, uh, but also particularly by the English and the German Romantics. And then it, it's, it's systematized um, in the German Academy, in the Geisteswissenschaften. And then it becomes basically the way of thinking about the humanities in the university. And it becomes so popularly held that to step outside of that is to appeal to something that they've already determined is illegitimate, demonstrated by the fact that they have thrown theology out of the university altogether. It's no longer a subject of study. Religious studies, yes. Theology, no. Theology has a very different trajectory than, the, than religious studies do. Religious studies is a study of, it's a sociological study of man as a religious animal. And it wants to trace that historically. Whereas theology is the study of God in terms of the way God reveals himself to us. It's predicated on the primacy of the authority of scripture as a different type of text altogether. It reveals something about human nature, but it fundamentally is a different origin. It does not originate in the mind of man. 
and religious studies always presume it does, and then they compare different types of religions across different cultures, and they tend towards panentheism. They unite them all. And so the inclusivism, religious inclusivism of the 19th century is, is a consequence of this general anthropological approach towards the topic of religion. A and it creates all sorts of crises within it that it can't uh, overcome. And that's why I called it the crisis of the human sciences. Uh, one of the, you know, my, my, my book, Romanticism, Hermeneutics, and the Crisis of the Human Sciences, that is the crisis. The, 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 the object of study is man, the subject that's doing the studying is man, and yet the question is, what is a man? And it doesn't answer the question, it begs the question. Begs the question. And it's a question that you cannot answer with objective truth because you're involved in the, in the study. Just taking the uh, methodology of the scientific experiment, you cannot remove yourself from the consideration, which you require to do in order to be objective about it. Are you biased? Are you neutral in the study of human nature? And the answer is no. We, we will see that, that feminist critics will accuse uh, male critics of being biased towards men and excluding women. And you'll find the same charge being made by different groups. They'll say, and, and following up on Heidegger's contention, they'll say that we're always already, by virtue of being in the world, biased and can't avoid uh, some sort of bias in our judgment of things. We're always involved in that through our language, through simply being in the world. I think the, it's a correct statement. There is a bias there or a prejudice, if you will, to put it even more um, pointedly. And so the view from nowhere is an impossibility, but that is the claim and aim of the French Enlightenment and the German Enlightenment and, and Kant prevents it, presents a, a methodology for that, for the view from nowhere, as if we were epistemologically neutral and, and in every respect neutral. And uh, many object to his view. And, and it really is, a, I think, an extension of Cartesianism, the idea that you're a mind and not a body, or the mind, or if you have a body, it's just an extension of the mind. It's a, it's a problematic anthropology. It's there problematic from the beginning. It's not solved by studying man as a historical phenomenon still begs the deeper philosophical question of what is a man and what I when I'm say man here I mean what is a human being and Bart when he comes to the point of um, claiming the death of the author is just simply um, engaging with a problem that arises in the romantic period because the romantics believe that the author is, is effectively connected to his feelings, the feelings and the intentions of the author are the author. So when we read a poem, the romantic uh, way of reading is that of Friedrich Schleiermacher, the great romantic or liberal father of modern liberal theology. He will believe that when, when we are reading, what we're trying to do is get inside the mind of the author, right? That's our aim. When we read a text, we're actually not reading the words in the, on the page. We're really trying to get inside the mind of the, the, uh, of the individual that wrote these words. We're trying to capture the authorial intention, which are expressed in the words, but not fully. And Schleiermacher, just to repeat what I've said on Schleiermacher, because I brought him up last semester, not this one, but I assume that uh, in this course that the other course is understood because I'm building as I go along. Schleiermacher says that we can know as well, if not better than the original author. Why? It's because of historical distance. So there's two interesting assertions there. One we can know as well if not even better. And secondly, the reason we can is because historical distance. And what is it about historical distance that gives such a, a superior vantage? It's that we can see the uh, 
differences between us and the author in terms of his worldview. And we can see where that author is deficient, lacking, or prejudiced, or caught up in the spirit of his age, but not really expressing what Schleiermacher, like everybody in the, this period, assumes, which is the progress of the spirit. And it's very interesting that Friedrich Schleiermacher is a uh, college roommate with none other than Hegel, who is the one who comes out with the phenomenology des Geistes, the phenomen phenomenology of spirit, because both of them have the same sense of the importance of the spirit uh, in uh, discussions of human nature. So the progress that takes place after this period is largely considered in spiritual terms, in the terms of Geist, if you will, as opposed to the political concerns that we just saw were at the forefront of the discussion amongst the feminists of the day, say Mary uh, Wollstonecraft. She's talking about not spirit, she's talking more about more practical considerations like um, the right to vote, She's considering other things, by the way, as well. But the first wave feminism is largely the suffragette movement and wanting um, a, a stake in the, in the po political realm. Uh, whereas in later iterations of feminism, it, it becomes a bit more spiritual, eventually it becomes wholly spiritual. By the time you get to the third and the fourth wave, it's very much of a spiritual movement. It's a spiritual notion of feminine, uh, such that a man can now claim to be a female if he believes himself spiritually to be a woman, then, that, then he is a woman. It's an identification with a woman. But at that point, it totally collapses because what does a feminine spirit actually mean? Without the sexual distinction between male and female, what does it mean? I believe that I'm a woman. Well, what is a woman? And you'd have to differentiate a, a male from a female, actually. That's par part of your problem there. But, and if you are a male, then you can't be this. But then you would have to uh, acknowledge the legitimacy of the law of non-contradiction, which is, again, in accordance with this tendency of reading and appeal to words as opposed to reasoning. Um, and here the reasoning is not a logical sort of the Aristotelian variety. It's a reasoning of a um, Hegelian variety. You're, you're, there's a... There, there's a a thesis, there's an antithesis, and this leads to a synthesis. So Aufhebung. You you so there's a man, there's a woman, and then there's a third category that is above man and woman, and it is a man that calls himself a woman or a woman that calls himself a man. So it's a unification. That's why I said that romanticism, the tendency of romanticism is towards a monism, a unity, and, and the number one. Whereas the Enlightenment tendency is to try and obliterate all of that and give, you us, give us the view from nowhere. And the two together end up doing the same thing one way or the other. I think they work hand in glove. The Enlightenment, the Romantic period is actually an extension of the Enlightenment. It doesn't ever remove itself from that project. It just disagrees on the best means of doing it. Uh, uh, the Romantics think it should happen through feeling. The Enlightenment thinks it should happen through reason, pure reason. Right? I think this is a general, generally accepted view of the difference between the Enlightenment and the Romantic period. The Romantics appeal to feeling and the faculty of the imagination which expresses that feeling and expresses the feeling of unity with all things. If you look at Wordsworth's writing, he talks about how he feels a unity between himself and the landscape. And it's in his mind, but he feels that and it's a way of uh, bringing about what he almost describes as the new birth, a birth of a noumenal sense of himself, which is unified and connected to all other minds. As if it and, and is posited to reside also in in nature in that typically romantic sense of nature as a divinized reality, very good. <laughs>
so the death of the author is predicated on the idea that the author is a thinking thing like Descartes and yet the world uh, conforms to his capacities to perceive it in a Kantian iteration of that. Right? So the mind um, creates, according to the categories it has, creates the perception of the reality and really the ultimate reality resides within the mind. And you'll, the Romantics repeatedly talk about that. And so then the aim with, with those steps in place for us to read a text is to try to, to think what, what was Wordsworth thinking when he wrote this text. I want to recover it. It is sort of, uh, what did uh, um, Gerald Bruns call it in Hermeneutics Ancient and Modern? He talked about it as a necromancy. sort of, yeah, necromancy. You're sort of like in calling up the dead, inhabiting their spirit and so forth. It, 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 I know what he means by that. And it's interesting in the light of what we saw about the Derrida's interest in zombies in literature and so forth and the, the, the what lives on and what can't be killed and the fact that there's a there's a sort of a synthesis between the alive and the dead note that both of them are an attack on the word then though the word is not really legitimate it's not the reality the reality is the spiritual thing that is lies in this space between the two antitheses of man and woman or good and evil there's a category that is above good and evil that includes them both. And that's why it is pantheistic or panentheistic even. And why it inclines, in, inclines towards uh, Hinduism, actually, uh, as, as some people point out. But in the death of the author, so let me get rid of this off this so not to make it even more difficult. In the death of the author, he begins a very strange, with this very strange example, uh, taken from a novella by Balzac called uh, Saracen, which is the tale of a sculptor who falls in love with an Italian diva who is revealed subsequently not to be a woman, but in fact a castrato. Do you know what a castrato is? It's a man who's been castrated before he hits, hits puberty. He's got a, a beautiful soprano voice. And in order to preserve that beautiful male soprano voice, because women have soprano voices, but it sounds a little different from a male soprano voice to preserve that the beauty of the voice they castrate them they're called castrato and um uh, bark focuses on a sentence in the text in which a series of exclamations about femininity cannot be clearly attributed to the conscious intentions of any one person whether that be the author the narrator the a character or even universal wisdom so let's just read a little excerpt from this. In his story, Saracen, Balzac, describing a castrato disguised as a woman, writes the following sentence. And he, this is again typical of the post-structuralists. They'll, they'll focus in on one phrase and then make it uh, fr as a microcosm of the whole. Say what's true of the sentence here, the little ambiguity here, is going to reflect a, a broader human condition. Um, we, we would call this proof texting and call it a, an illegitimate practice of reading. But it's, it's characteristic of the period. But anyway, writes the following sentence. This was woman herself with her sudden fears, her irrational whims, her instinctive worries, her impetuous boldness, her fussings, and her delicious sensibility. Who is speaking thus, says Bard. Is it the hero of the story bent on remaining ignorant of the castrato hidden beneath the woman? Is it Balzac, the individual, the author of the tale, uh, furnished by his personal experience with a philosophy of woman? Note that he cap it's capitalized in the English here. Woman in a sort of a, a platonic sense, uh, idealized form. Is it Balzac, the author, professing literary ideas on femininity? Is it universal wisdom, romantic psychology? We shall never know for the good reason that writing is the destruction of every voice, of every point of origin. Writing is that neutral, composite, oblique space where our subject slips away, the negative where all identity is lost, starting with the very identity of the body writing. 
of Balzac, in other words, the very person who's writing, his identity is also slipping away. And note that the importance here is that writing is at, at every point of origin. Here's a huge sort of tell of how this is romanticism, because romanticism, just like the whole human sciences project, always wants to trace human history back to a point of origin. The point of origin is primitive man before he can reason or speak. He grunts and cries. That's the, from the human perspective, how we see our ancestors. And then we'll just add a timeline to it later because it becomes ridiculous to imagine that we go from grunts and cries like animals to being uh, in the scientific age or even actually in the philosophical age a few, thou a few thousand years later because we see evolution on that scale at that speed not happening. So that necessitates the idea of an older Earth. That, that's the reason. It's just posited, and it's posited because it doesn't make sense for a, a caveman who grunts and cries to then a few thousand later emerge as a more rational being than we are, namely Plato and Aristotle and Socrates. Just doesn't make sense. It's not on a timeline, we see no such speed of development. So they have to posit a, an earlier form of human existence for which there is no record, by the way. And there can't be because writing doesn't exist. And writing is the record that such people exist and were able to think. So it's, it's posited as a hypothesis to demonstrate the legitimacy of the anthropological way of looking at man by man. And I say that the whole thing from the beginning to end is one long hypothesis attempting to get around the approach of the study of man that presents it as an implication of bearing the image of God and therefore it's going to appeal to the legitimacy of the Christian narrative. And that's the foundation of the university. But if you're going to move the university away from that, you have to have a different origin, which will then have authority. This is the point of the origin. The authority the origin has authority. It determines what happens after. You go back to the origin and that originating point is going to determine the meaning and the character and the trajectory of everything that happens uh, going after. And the romantic view of origin is that we did not begin by fiat creation out of nothing by God, but rather we began in flux in a sort of chaotic prime, primeval soup And then we go from uh, the soup, which is the zoo, or from it is a sort of a goo, and then we end up in the zoo, and then we end up with you. We go from the goo, the primeval soup, to develop animals. They, they develop through evolution, and then eventually we get human beings. That's, that's the account. I mean, I'm, I'm ridiculing it, obviously, because it is ridiculous. I'm, I'm happy to ridicule what's ridiculous and not call it science. Not, it, it deserves no such appellation. But that's because it, it, it appeals to the point of origin as the authorization for what comes after. And so the, uh, the psychological discipline will see our original uh, humanity in our feelings, in the grunts and cries, and the romantics will agree with this, that we're most understood through our feelings, which we share with the animals. Animals also have feelings. They have sentient souls or vegetable souls, if you want to use Aristotelian vocabulary. They grow, they feel, they have sensation. You know, if you, if you touch a plant, some of them recoil immediately, but all of them will move. And they'll move like a, a flower will follow the sun. There's a, a, in that sense, it has a sensitive soul and shares commonality with the animals and human beings. It has sensitivity. And that's going to be the foundation for a certain view of human nature that you'll find not only in psychology, but even in churches. They'll talk about people's feelings all the time, as if this was the essence of the human beings in front of them. Because that's their understanding of the point of origin. And that therefore, the essence of the thing we're talking about in front of us. I have to take care of people's feelings as, as my primary task. Um, and it just begs the question, whether this, it is the case that writing is the destruction of every voice of every point of origin. But even if it does, who cares? Well, the romantic cares because it, the appeal to origins is central to the romantic enterprise. 
and the human sciences for that matter because progress depends on having that original point. There's a further implication of that original point, by the way, which is that human being, human nature, is not given to us by virtue of the fact that we bear the image of God and are therefore ipso facto persons because God is a person. And it is this that if it's not that view of creation, it is a evolutionary view, uh, which is the account that we read in the creation myths. Actually, I shouldn't call them the creation myths. The myths of origins of the pagan world, where they begin in chaos. And you, you can read that in Greek myths and any of the Mesopotamian myths, uh, the Roman myths. They will start with a uncertainty about where human life began, but it often begins with some sort of strife uh, out of chaos. Everything emerges out of chaos. And if it begins out of chaos, then you can, it, it eventually goes back to chaos. It reverts back to its origins and it legitimates chaos and disorder. It, it, it authorizes disorder. And you can, as Jordan Peterson does, try and fight against the chaos, say it's important psychologically not to believe the chaos myth, but he, his whole uh, body of intellectual work is predicated on chaos at the origins. So you're fighting against something that ultimately is going to defeat you because that is who you are. You're ultimately a chaotic being. And uh, ultimately you are irrational. You're motiv motivated by irrational forces. Well, that's what psychology always concludes because it sees ourselves uh, to be situated in our feelings. Peterson sees as a man who has some sensitivity to the people around him who are suffering that you need order in your life. You need a sense of meaning and purpose and you need to fight for this and as if you were a person. But he doesn't believe that you are fundamentally. You're fundamentally an animal that's developed this. So person does not characterize the people in front of them. Feelings do and they can become persons by taking on the great quest of humanity to be like the biblical heroes of old. So that it's sort of like a, it's, a, it's an archetypal way of reading uh, scripture, a very Jungian, spiritualized way of reading every text and, and has the same sort of trajectory. But at any rate, Balzac here, uh, the author, main, we can't even know that Balzac was the author because if we go back to the origin of this, the writing destroys the voice and we can never get to the voice of Balzac. This is going to be, in terms of literary theories, I said at the outset of last semester's course, when we want to describe what a good literary theory does, we need to include uh, something like an Aristotelian view of four causes. We have to account for the author, and we have to all account for the text, just in terms of the whole of the text, but also the literary devices. And then we have to think about the audience. We have to consider these four things. But I don't think this actually works unless you are in a theological framework. Because the author, author's intentions are predicated on our, our authorship having authority. And it doesn't have authority because of the problem of human nature that we can't know ourselves. The very thing that Socrates uh, was known for asking and, uh, to himself uh, as the great injunction, know thyself. Know thyself. And he went around trying to figure out what a human being was. He went asking other people. And it, 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 was, a, it was a motto of the Delphic Oracle who pronounced Socrates the wisest man in the world. Know thyself. A, a, the quest for human beings to know themselves. Socrates went around to people who claimed to know a great deal about a great number of things and found out that their, their claims were usually baseless. They were pretending. And, and doing so with authority, but they lacked the authority that they claimed for themselves. And he'd tear, tear them apart and they'd end up, you know, wanting to punch him in the nose, which is a short uh, little 
ugly nose and they said, you know, I want to punch you in your, your stubby little nose and you get a picture of Socrates, he wasn't a great looker, I guess. <coughs> and, and people would get really angry at it and I think Plato thought this was hilarious. But, but the problem of the author having authority depends on a sense of authority that goes outside the chaos and, and flux of being a human being with its moral uh, limitations and mortal limitations. So we need to uh, take this idea of a good literary theory and within a theological framework. I'll, I'll get to that when I talk about my own literary theory in a few classes, but we have to appeal to a notion of authorship which is uh, predicated on a divine authorship and furthermore the, the story revealed by that author in scripture, which is revealed in scripture and also revealed in history then because a people is forged in the light of that story and they live in accordance with that. This is the kingdom of God, right? On the basis of God's interactions with people in history, a people is forged that are different than the people of the world that don't follow that God. And that's also described in scripture. Uh, I'll get to that. But then there's a text that the author has and then there are certain literary devices. Now I've said that to you that uh, most literary theories will usually only focus on one of the four. And the Romantics very much are authoritarian because they appeal to the authority of the author, specifically themselves. And they do it by disputing the authority of any other author that's not themselves. And on what basis? Because they're not progressive. Pretty much it. I don't like. <laughs> their appeal to authority, so I'm going to appeal to a higher authority, namely my authority. Now, that sounds very narcissistic, and it is. The way they get around the narcissism and the selfishness, of, the obvious selfishness of the, the move is they say that my self is the same as your self. It's a universal self. We all share the same self. I called it the crisis of self-legitimation in the period. Um, that's how they get around it. But later writers will say that, well, the self that they claim is common to everybody not only is not common to everybody because everybody's uh, human being is different and they actually feel differently about things and think differently about things, but even this sense of self is incoherent. What exactly do we mean by a self? Is it a rational self? or is an irrational self. Because their account of origins is irrational, fundamentally it is an irrational self. That's the problem. And so they can never justify it as a, as a legitimate study, uh, as an origin of a coherent, scientific, um, credible academic discipline. But that is the state that we're in right now. We live in that academy that assumes the legitimacy of what the romantics and their project initiated. It assumes the legitimacy. And then it just says, there, but there are all sorts of problems with this. But it, it doesn't say, well, given the, the, the number of problems by the, the number of scholars over the length of time and the fact that each iteration of it seems to be more problematic than, the, than the, six, the, the previous one, maybe you want to consider whether the initial point was the big problem. And this is the conclusion I made when I came to faith. That was exactly it. That this is utter nonsense. We need to go back prior to the Romantics and prior to the Enlightenment project uh, of Rousseau and company that spawned the whole Romantic enterprise. But, it, but here he asks the question, it, it, here it's just a short uh, little essay, but it eventually becomes a full book uh, in his book, SZ, by the way, because an S sounds like a Z, depending on how you say it, right? But this, so the death of the author eventually, if you want a lengthier uh, presentation of this, and I wouldn't recommend it, but if you want one, then you can look to SZ. Uh, he focuses on this sentence where a, a whole series of exclamations about femininity cannot be clearly attributed to the conscious intentions of any one person. Any one. We can't identify. It could be this, could be that, because there's ambiguity. When he says, this was woman herself, 
with her sudden fears of irrational whims or instinctive way. Who is saying this? Is it Balzac, the individual? Is this the man Balzac? Is he making a generic statement? Uh, is it universal wisdom speaking? What exactly, what sort of statement is this? Are we taken, taken to take this as an authoritative statement on women? Because if it is, he's talking about a castrado who's not a woman. By the way, Balzac would, uh, by uh, Bart, would be thrown out of the academy for suggesting this now because he suggests um, that uh, the appeal to a castrado as a woman is in some way illegitimate or they're not identical. Comment then from Bart. No doubt it has always been that way. So they begin with the romantic postulate and then they extend it back universally. It's always been that's wh that way, that we could not know who the author was and what he intended. All we know is that there's a text. The, the author can't say, come forward, unless uh, if he's dead, he can't say, this is what I meant. We have to presume that we know what the author intends. And contrary to what Schleiermacher says that we can know as well, if not better, we can't know at all what the author intended other than what the author wrote. So the text kills the author. That's the force of the argument. As soon as it's written and it's in words, it's no longer in thought or spirit and the thought or the spirit defines the author, therefore the author's dead. So the spirit is the author. Here we have the, the letter rather than the spirit, therefore the author who is the spirit is gone. And we can't recover that through a sort of a necromancy. Uh, a necromancy, re necromancic hermeneutics. I just made up a word. Mm -hmm. It has always been this way. As soon as a fact is narrated, no longer with a view to acting directly on reality, but intransitively, that is to say, finally outside of any function other than that of the very practice of the symbol itself, this disconnection occurs. The voice loses its origin. The author enters into his own death writing begins. The sense of this phenomenon, however, has varied. In ethnographic studies, now he's going to talk, out, he's going to take his initial premise from a, a little line from Balzac about a castrato and now talk about it in the human, humanities more broadly speaking, or the human sciences to be more accurate. In ethnographic studies, so studies of cultures, the responsibility for a narrative is never assumed by a person, but by a mediator, a shaman, or a relator whose performance, the mastery of the narrative code, may possibly be admired, but never his genius. We don't admire the genius of the, of the, the shaman. The shaman has a function, but he doesn't have authority himself. We don't think, wow, that was, a, that was the best performance of the rights of the native tribe that I've ever seen. You're not saying this is a great shaman. He, he's way better than the previous, you know, the dance that's done to invoke the spirits. That's a better one. We don't talk about his genius. We talk more about the narrative being a, a right that is performed and that's the meaning. The meaning is the right and not the performance of the right, let alone the performer of the right. Let's not talk about the performer because the performer is irrelevant. Whereas in the romantic period, we always talk about the genius. It's the cult of the genius. It originates in this period, the, the sense of an author having being a, a genius figure and everybody wants to be a genius. And the way you become a genius, by the way, is being uh, acting like a, an orphan and coming up with a narrative that is sufficiently compelling to include everybody else in it. And then they follow you as the, gert, as the great Führer, the leader, a thought leader. I'm told I should try and be a thought leader. I don't want to be the Führer of anybody. Deeply problematic. But anyway, that's the phrase used today, right? A thought leader. What does that actually mean? I mean, I'm I'm happy to engage in thinking and to help others to think, but to be a thought leader and, and, and to some degree you track with somebody else's thoughts, yes, but 
thinking is something that is legitimized outside the person that's doing the thinking and it appeals to uh, the categories of thinking among other things like the laws of logic. And there are authorities that better be able to contradict your thought leader. Otherwise your thought leader is going to be a tyrant. Anyway, the author is a modern figure, a product of our society insofar as emerging from the Middle Ages with English empiricism, there's an odd. English empiricism in the Middle Ages? I thought the English empiricist began with Locke after the Renaissance and the Reformation. But never mind. French rationalism and the personal faith of the Reformation. Okay, it's after this, but English empiricism from the Middle Ages. So it jumps over the Renaissance. It discovered the procedure of the individual, which is a very Renaissance thing. It talks about the individual very much true. Or of, as it more, more nobly put, the human person. So he thinks and suggests that the human person is a creation of the combined force of English empiricism, French rationalism, and the Reformation. But anybody who has studied the concept of personhood will find that it has uh, it, it originates even in the classical age, but is most fully expressed and made into an orthodox doctrine by the church fathers when they're talking about the Trinity, the three persons of God. There's where person originates as a stable category of distinction. And he ignores that. He presents it as a, a late development. Personhood emerges late. Again, Foucault is going to argue the exact same thing. He says that man, now he's not person, but he says man, because he wants to, um, he, he likes the connotations of man versus woman and sexuality and the legitimacy of that. So he wants, he pushes it more in that direction. And both man and person are coterminous in some way, but one suggests differentiation because there are, in personhoods, there can be otherness and not just sameness. Whereas in man, it's a generic category that doesn't admit to differentiation. There are different men, but there's no different man. Man is, includes male and female. Uh, but he says the human person, so it's a late developing category. Completely fallacious, historically false, just wrong. At this point, you just say, no, I'm not going to, I'm going to stop you right there. Anyway, it is thus logical, if you, build, if you buy this, it is thus logical that in literature should be this positivism, the epitome and culmination of capitalist ideology. Okay, so now we have to bring Marx. Right, so there's a tendentiousness. It, it, it assumes romanticism's uh, view of the importance of origins. It then casts that back a little bit further to French rationalism, English empiricism, and the personal faith of the Reformation. Not the theology, but just the personal faith development, uh, dimension, I guess. Um, and then out of that comes a capitalist ideology which has attached the greatest importance to the person of the author. And he's going to go after personhood explicitly. And this is one of the things that I said last time is characteristic of postmodern literary theories is that they are anti-humanist. You could say anti-personalist, if you will. But let's say anti-humanist because humanism has such a good, rich Christian legacy. Although when we say that, we have to, I guess, distinguish what we mean by humanism then and connect it with the personhood uh, narrative of the, of the early church doctrine. Trinitarian discussions and the, and the implications for human nature, which I even discussed last time at the outset of the talk when I was talking about feminism and saying, well, the feminist theories begin in the 19th century as well. Funny enough, they just happened to begin in the 19th century. And the rights of women were fought for the first time. Women had no rights before this. And I suggested to you, well, actually, not true at all. And women had property rights and had rights that uh, they could appeal to in the legal courts, and they had rights against their husbands, not only against other men. And there was capital punishment for things like rape, which the Empress Theodora brought in place and became true of all of Christendom. So the idea of personhood, 
that it originates so late is absurd, false, tendentious, and slanderous. So it's not just personhood that's at stake, it's Christian personhood that is being assaulted here. And it's done, it's appealing to a, a, a less uh, religious expression of it, but nonetheless person is a Christian category. And so this is a direct attack, I would say, on Christian theology made through anthropology. And this is why the church doesn't care about it, because they only think that the gospel is related to theology. It's a theological issue. It's not an anthropological issue, when obviously it's both, because Jesus is God and man. It's both. It, it must be. And so if you're going to attack Jesus' human nature, because you're attacking human nature in general, you're also going to implicate theology in the whole conundrum. And bring it into chaos and introduce all the postmodern literary theories into the academy as if they were legitimate when I think they're wholly illegitimate. Anyway, the author still reigns in histories of literature, biographies of writers, interviews, magazines, and are in the very consciousness of men of letters anxious to unite their person and their work through diaries and memoirs. The image of literature to be found in ordinary culture is tyrannically centered on the author, his person, his life, his tastes, his passions, while criticism still contains, consists for the most part in saying that Baudelaire's work is the failure of Baudelaire the man, Van Gogh's his madness, Tchaikovsky's his vice. The explanation of a work is always sought in the man or woman who produced it, as if it were always in the end, through the more or less transparent allegory of a fiction, the voice of a single person, the author confiding in us. So it's always appealing to the author to understand the work. And that's the product of romantic hermeneutics. Yes, it is. But is that approach to reading, was it legitimate from the outset? And I think the answer is no, it's not. It's not sufficient. But every human text lacks authority unless it can appeal above itself, outside itself, to general categories of thinking and human nature furthermore. And human nature only has legitimacy if each one of us is a person and furthermore has the capacity to appeal to the laws of logic, which according to this man and the whole romantic tradition now expressed in the French Academy is of very late origin. It's in the 18th, 19th century, and it's plainly false. But if we do that, let's, let's just agree with him, having made my disagreement, now we'll agree with him. That will then lead us to say, well, actually, when we're reading a text, it's, it's something like a fallacy of, what are we going to call it? We're going to call it the intentional fallacy. To appeal to the intent of the author because we don't know what the intention of the author we only know what he wrote let's not claim that the author's intent has an authority above the text because the text is the expression of the author's intent Bart's making a much stronger point however than that of the new critics because the new critics say that they they are opposed to the intentional fallacy because it's a way of misreading the text. It's to suggest the text is not important. It's the spirit that's, intent, that's important. There are, remember, there are, the new critics are, de are defending the word against the war waged upon it by the spiritual enterprise of the Geisteswissenschaften. Uh, they'll say, no, we can't recover that. But also, they will say that we can't only, only uh, shouldn't appeal to the intentional fallacy. We also should not appeal to what they call the effective fallacy. And the effective fallacy appeals to its spiritual effect on the audience. Both of these are fallacious forms of reading. What did the author feel about it on the one hand? How do I feel about it on the other? These are bogus as, as if they're considered to be the authoritative reason for reading texts. How I feel about the text is not the primary consideration, although it, it is a consideration. But shorn of any authority for an author, which is only there if we 
understand that we are persons that share the Imago Dei and therefore human texts are part of the culture making enterprise which God grants to us by virtue of the fact we bear his image and we're given the mandate to uh, bring a culture into the world of nature, if you will. Only then will, the, um, will we, we be able to escape the intentional and the effective fallacies. But these are pointed out by the new critics and Bart is in a sense reiterating this but making it a much stronger point that we can't actually, the author is dead. We don't have any access to it at all. He, he's, he's like a new critic but pushing it in a, in a decidedly, decidedly anti-humanist way that the new critics never did. They see themselves working in, a, in the context of tradition. So T.S. Eliot, who's often allied with the new critics, although he isn't one, will talk about tradition and the individual talent, but he'll talk about an individual working with a series of texts and with an authoritative tradition of orthodoxy, etc. And we write in the context of previous texts and we engage with them as if the author were writing and speaking in our midst and we don't know what the author meant other than what the author has written, but the, what the author has written really allows the author to live. It's, a, it's sufficient. And we revere the author in that sense. Now, my, my, I'll just conclude this because I'm running out of time. I started late. Uh, very good book on this topic. It, my friend Sean Burke, who is an internal examiner for my thesis at Durham University, uh, wrote a book on this. If you're interested, this is the third edition, sorry it's a little bit blurry here, on the death and return of the author, criticism and subjectivity in Bart, Foucault, and Derrida. Uh, and he, he demonstrates, uh, I think in a very witty way, he's a good writer by the way, as well as a funny man, uh, and that the, this is an anti-humanist uh, enterprise on the part of all three men. Ultimately, it is anti-humanistic, and I remember having conversations with, with him and Patricia Waugh, who was uh, head of department for a while there, but also a formidable literary theorist on exactly that postmodernism, postmodern literary theories, effectively being anti humanist and therefore really at odds with the humanities altogether in their tendencies. And he argues against uh, Bart very powerfully, I think, in a very witty fashion. I can point you to that. I'm not going to reiterate what he says there. I have the book on my shelf, at least the second edition. Um, but I'll, I'll just leave it off with that. But I just want to give you a sense of the thrust of, of the uh, engagement here and the premises is here. And though the author remains powerful, he says, certain writers have long since attempted to loosen it and eventually the author's death. So it begins, and this is very interesting, the 19th century proclaims the death of God. 20th century literary theory proclaims the death of man. God has no authority. Nietzsche, Nietzsche is the one who proclaims it. God is dead. God is dead and we've killed him. What does he mean by that? Is he celebrating it? Is he just saying this is the tendency? And I think, he, I think it's the latter. He's saying the romantic approach has killed God, the authority of God. And it's just the implication of that. And it, it must it must follow if we bear the image of God and if God is no authority, then neither the human authors. And that, that's where the postmodern literary critics push it. And I think they probably do so legitimately. So I'm actually going to agree with the postmodern literary critics that we have killed the author and I'm going to hoist them up by their own petard and say, so then will you not cease and desist with the stupid path of the human sciences and recover your senses and engage with the humanities in a legitimate fashion and there is only one on offer now and it is the Christian approach to the humanities. So we'll leave it with that. <laughs>